Welcome everyone to AE311. Uh, today's topic is designing for human vision. So we're going to take some of the uh, knowledge that we gained on Monday about our visual system and turn that into actionable design advice. So there are two major areas we can discuss. The first one is visual performance. And so this is a busy slide. Um, there's a variety of factors. We're going to break these down in a little more detail as we progress uh, throughout the lecture. Um, but the basic process here is uh, first we need to define the visual task. Then we need to anticipate our typical observers. And then we can, we can select appropriate criteria. Now, the good news is that all of this work has already been done for you. And specifically, uh, you can find tables like this one of design criteria in the IES handbook, in the IES online library. And you'll be, you can look up your specific visual task uh, based on your building type. Uh, and then you can get specific illuminance and uniformity criteria. And I'll point out here real quick that all of this criteria is based on observer age. So your illuminance criteria typically is going to increase uh, for older observers. And we'll get to exactly why that is in a moment. Now, the specific numerical values are going to be derived from the performance factors that we know to be relevant uh, to lighting. And that's specifically going to be our task factors over there at the top. So let's, uh, let's start digging into that. So our first task factor is simply size. Now, it's important to point out that this is not like size as in area of a task because the distance matters too. So this is actually going to be angular size again. And angular size is really the relevant uh, metric for the size of a visual task. Uh, because of the way that light radiates uh, circularly outward. Um, so there's a great example at the top there. You can see that that larger text is easy to read and that tiny text is hard to read and you may not have even noticed it yet. You can get the same effect basically by walking across the room and trying to read the larger text. So it's not just the size of the task, but also our visual distance to the task uh, that is going to determine the angular size that we're worried about. So the next aspect of interest is contrast. So you can see a great example right here uh, with the, the black on gray text. No problem to read that, uh, but white on gray, there is text in there, I promise, though depending on your screen, you might not be able to tell at all. So contrast is going to happen on two fronts. Uh, basically, you, you have color contrast or the contrast of the, the colors of the object. And also you have luminance contrast, which is more driven by the lighting solutions. When we're talking about contrast, usually we express that as a ratio or a percentage uh, of the luminance between two regions. So in this case here, we have the task region, which is the text itself, and the background region, which is that gray background. So you're really mostly interested in the luminance ratio between the task and the background. Not all contrast is bad. And that I think is important to point out here because contrast can be actually a powerful design solution. So in a lot of cases, for example, a classroom whiteboard, you want high uniformity. You don't want a whole lot of contrast because that's going to reduce uh, visual performance in a way that's problematic for that space. However, down here in this retail setting, we're actually using contrast constructively to draw visual focus to the intended destination. And so 
not all contrast is bad. Some contrast is an intentional design choice. The time that you, you are engaging in the visual task matters a lot. And so that's why you see uh, stadiums that are extremely brightly lit and extremely uniformly lit. Um, and that's because when you're making snap judgments, uh, you need more light in order to get the same visual performance. So the length of the task time is going to matter. So taking us out of sports, a lot of industrial settings is where this comes into play in a big way when you're doing fast tasks or time-limited tasks of any kind. And that brings me to safety. And this is a big part of the way we set up our design criteria because when there is human health and safety on the line, there's no reason not to provide more light. So it can be a some, something as simple as a kitchen prep area, um, but more, more relevant actually is going to be driving. So uh, headlights are a big thing in lighting design overall. It's actually its own entire subfield. Uh, and you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of people heavily into optics because where and how you place light on the road matters. And it's going to change the way you experience things in the road at night and how fast you can react to uh, problems and obstructions. Another big area uh, that's crucial for lighting is surgical lighting. Actually, my, my first uh, study was actually in surgical lighting. And we're looking at actually CCT because I'm a color scientist. Uh, as it turns out, color doesn't really matter, but the amount of light really does matter, and also the uniformity of that light. So surgical light heads are extremely expensive luminaires uh, that deliver extremely high levels of light and very uniform light in a specific zone that is entirely aimable, and that's so that you can get the best possible visual acuity at that surgical site. So the importance or safety concerns associated with a task are going to change the way you set up your design criteria. So to review uh, our key task factors of size, contrast, time, and safety are how the IAS defines their illuminance and uniformity criteria that you look up in the handbook. And it's important to understand the basis of that design criteria so that you also understand when you need to take those values at face value because maybe there's human lives at stake um, or maybe it's not that important or the amount of contrast is higher than expected or the task size is smaller than expected. And so that's going to educate when you actually need to modify the baseline design criteria provided by the IAS handbook. So that brings me to uh, the aging eye and age-related effects on vision. So I've got some bad news for all of you. The best vision you will ever have for the rest of your life is right now. And now. In fact, this is a one-way process. Your vision will only degrade as you age, unfortunately. And there's three major processes at play here. So the first pr part of this, and we're ignoring medical conditions for the record, so we're not going to discuss cataracts or macular degeneration. These are the age-related effects on vision that are coming for all of us. The first aspect is reduced light, and there's several factors at play here in the structure of the eye. Your lens yellows, which is going to let less light through, and actually it can have some subtle effects on your color perception as well. Uh, the humors, both the aqueous and the vitreous humor, can cloud, therefore 
uh, also reducing light. It also actually increases potential for glare because it can increase the diffraction of light within the eye itself. Your pupil size decreases. Really, this is maximum pupil size. Uh, and that's because the iris has to uh, open up to allow that to happen uh, instead of relaxing to close it down. So your maximum pupil size decreases, which means the light entering your eye at all is also decreased. And then finally, after all of these effects that are decreasing the amount of light, make light making it back to your retina, your retina's response also decreases. So your photoreceptors, your cones and your rods become less sensitive to light and they're also receiving less light. Reduced accommodation. So two major things at play here. First off, your lens, uh, not only does it yellow, it also hardens over time and it thickens which means it's going to be less flexible, uh, which makes it even worse that the ciliary muscles also weaken. So you have weaker ciliary muscles that are less capable of changing the shape of your harder and thicker lens. So this is exactly what leads to presbyopia or age-related hyperopia, uh, which is the reduced ability to focus on nearby fine detail, which is why most of your parents probably have reading glasses sitting around the house. And the last important age-related effect on your eye is slower adaptation. So two big features at play here. Again, it's your iris, uh, which is weakening and therefore is less able to uh, to fully dilate your pupil. And it's also less able to quickly change size in response to differing light stimuli. Also, uh, in the back of your eye on your retina and your fovea, your opsins are going to slow, more slowly regenerate as your eye ages. So we already have problems with slow regeneration and in that bleaching is much faster than regeneration, which is why you get those after image effects when you stare into the sun. Uh, However, that's going to only get worse as you get older. So let's take a look at some solutions uh, for, uh, for older people. So um, the solutions are similar to what we discussed before. Obviously, you're going to need more light, and you'll see that in the design criteria. If you're designing for, uh, designing for say, a nursing home, your, uh, your recommended light levels will go up considerably. But another important aspect is more uniform light. And so this is an important role of the lighting designer is to lay out your lights in an effective manner so that you don't have bright spots and dark spots. And we'll get into the details of this later, uh, but a big part of this is spacing criteria. So you don't actually line up like the edges of your uh, pools of light, you actually want your uh, lights to cross over in the middle because the highest intensity is going to be directly below your light source. And as you get out further towards the edge of the beam, the intensity decreases. So we have a, uh, we have a metric for that, that's spacing criteria. And that's how far apart you want to place your luminaires so that you get the most pop, most uniform light possible on your work plane. And then finally, um, less of a lighting design consideration, uh, but nonetheless, an important consideration is the uh, architectural finishes in your space. And so you can do a lot to increase the contrast of the objects themselves uh, by providing higher contrast finishes. So things like caution tape to highlight hazards can go a long way on this front. You can also reinforce this with lighting by highlighting those steps, uh, but it's far easier and cheaper to do that with your finishes. Okay, so 
that brings us out of visual performance and into visual comfort. So the main factors are above and the first and foremost aspect of visual comfort is visual performance. If you can't see well, it's not going to be comfortable. So I won't go into more detail on visual performance. We just covered it. Uh, however, don't forget that that is the first stop in the process of visual comfort. Now, overall, when we're talking about visual comfort as opposed to visual performance, it's much less quantitative. So I didn't get into the math behind those key factors in visual performance, but there is a lot of math that goes into that. And all of those factors are directly quantifiable. When we're talking about visual comfort, it's a little more difficult to quantify. And oftentimes this comes down to uh, design solutions to get us to where we wanna be. So I'll start with an easy one because speaking of design solutions, this one has mostly been solved. It, obviously, Flickr is still a common trope in movies, um, and it used to be, let's call it a feature of cheap LEDs. However, for the most part, uh, those, Flickr is not a major concern. The two main causes uh, of Flickr when it does happen is going to be first and foremost uh, ballast and driver failures. So if you've ever seen like the ants crawling down a fluorescent tube, which is what this picture is showing here, um, that's the that's the power supply failing. And uh, so it can be in the lamp, but oftentimes it's the ballast not providing the right power to keep that thing uniformly illuminated. More commonly and more relevant to all of you, because you won't be specifying a whole lot of fluorescence in the future, is dimming. Dimming incompatibility is still a problem with LEDs. And that's largely because when we're, when we're doing analog dimming, we're messing with the power supply to the LED. An incandescent light source is happy with that. You cut the power down and it just emits less light because there's less power flowing through the filament. LEDs hate this stuff. LEDs have a very narrow range of, of electrical characteristics where they operate within. So you have specific forward voltage and, and supply current. And if you are not giving it that, it just won't work. And so the driver actually has to compensate for that kind of bad behavior from an analog dimmer and try to interpret what that signal means and also clean up the power to deal with that so oftentimes if you have a cheap enough dimmer and a cheap enough led that can lead to some pretty serious flicker problems so the solution here is simply proper specification so this is entirely on the lighting designer it's a very easy to solve problem nowadays and if it's not being solved, it's typically either in a residential situation or, or the lighting designer really is not doing their job because we have equipment specified for LEDs. We can have analog dimmers and uh, LED drivers typically last, last forever uh, if you're specifying quality equipment. So I'll talk a little about shadow and honestly, I could talk a lot about shadow, but I just want to introduce some basic concepts here and some basic design solutions. So shadow is going to be driven by the room geometry, specifically the, the source to room to task geometry. So you can see an example of that here where you have a single point source uh, that is uh, only going to have sight lines to part of the task wall over here to the right. And what that'll lead to is very sharp, harsh shadows. And that's very rarely what you're looking for uh, from a design perspective. Uh, and it's going to reduce the uh, task contrast within that shadow 
and lead to uh, lead to lower visual acuity because of that and increase the difficulty of the task because not only do you have reduced contrast within the shadow, you also have problematic contrast uh, against the nearby region, which doesn't have that shadow. So your visual system is going to have to adjust in fine detail to compensate for that shadow, uh, which um, can happen, but it's going to make that visual task a lot more challenging. More typically, rather than a hard point source, what you're going to have is more of an area source. And an area source will lead to necessarily softer shadows and also make the shadowing less problematic overall. So that brings me to some of the solutions we have for shadowing in our architectural environments. Uh, so some of the big solutions are um, larger sources and indirect sources. So for example, here we have indirect lighting, which is going to inner reflect light throughout the space, meaning the light isn't coming from one angle, right? The sources are up there, but it's not like the light's just coming straight down from those sources. It's bouncing off the ceiling. So you have a whole bunch of angles, which are going to fill in fill in the gaps and create that very nice, soft, shadowless ambient fill light. So ambient lighting is really one of the main solutions to problems with shadows. Another great solution is indirect lighting. So you can see these fixtures here. Some of the light is coming straight down from them. But if you look at the way the ceiling is illuminated, you'll notice that actually these fixtures are sending most of their light upwards. And so this is a indirect direct type fixture, and we'll get into what that means in detail in the Luminaires class in a couple of weeks. Um, but indirect lighting really does help fill in those shadows in the same way uh, that larger area sources do. So this approach is using uh, both solutions at once. Um, task lighting, obviously, uh, over that chair up there is another great solution. If you can't easily get your overhead fixtures to provide light directly to a location, add a task light. It's oftentimes far cheaper uh, and also allows more user control of their environment, which is almost always preferred for visual comfort and user controllability. And lastly, of course, your, your other option is to use it constructively in your design. So much in the same way that contrast is useful for, uh, for creating visual foci, shadow is the exact same approach. And so you can use shadow constructively in your designs, but the goal here is to do it intentionally uh, with a specific design goal in mind don't want to just have shadows and suffer through them. You want to utilize those shadows if you're going to have them. Okay, so a little bit on glare. Uh, so there's two major types of glare, or if you ask your textbook, uh, three major types of glare, though I've never really understood um, why it thinks there's three. There's two, and I'm going to give you all the names that you're likely to come across for these types of glare. So the first one is veiling or reflected glare. And the problem with veiling and reflected glare is it's going to substantially reduce task visibility by reducing the contrast. So here's a great example, right? You can't see through the glass uh, because it's reflecting off that surface. Um, also extremely common is computer screens. And so that veiling glare reduces the contrast of the screen behind the glare and makes it much harder for you to see what's on that screen. Now, veiling or reflected glare is basically exclusively a problem with reflective surfaces, right? So you, you have the windows above me or the screen to my right, uh, which are all specular surfaces or surfaces that directly 
reflect light. And so specular surfaces uh, are nice because they're predictable. So we can use the geometry of the space to predict our veiling glare and eliminate it. So what you need to know to address veiling glare are basically three things. You need to know where your viewers are going to be. So if we're talking about uh, reducing glare on a desk, that's a very straightforward process. Here's an example in an art gallery setting. Uh, so once you know where your viewer is situated, you need to know the viewing angle or the geometry between their eyes and the task, right? And finally, you need to know your reflection angle. And really, you can work backwards into this. And the reflection angle is the reflection angle of the, um, of the light source to the task surface. And with specular surfaces, these are direct reflections. So the angle, the angle of incidence in this case uh, is going to be the same as the angle of reflection. So knowing that geometry, uh, knowing that we have uh, this angle coming in, which will give us the opposite angle going out, we can predict where to place the lights so that no viewer could possibly uh, fall in line with the angle of reflection. So this is that a great example of that. You see that concealment zone at the top and at the bottom. And you're going to place lights there because you expect that no viewers are going to get down on their hands and knees and look directly up at that painting specifically to get veiling glare. So a similar process can be applied to uh, desks or computer labs. Uh, so this is an important uh, consideration for the placement of your lights uh, within a lot of common settings uh, like offices. Okay, so we have direct or disability or discomfort glare. And Basically, this is the type of glare caused by a light source in your field of view. So the important factors for direct glare are the luminance of the source, the size of the source, uh, the background luminance, and of course, the position in your field of view. So breaking that down a little more, uh, the source luminance or the overall brightness obviously is the main driving factor. Um, but it's not the only driving factor. Source size matters a lot too. And here's a great example of that. When you have these little point source LEDs and they're bare and there's like no diffuser in front of them to soften that, those little tiny point sources can be really intense when you look at them. So we solved that, that problem by adding diffusers or reflectors so that you're not viewing those tiny little LEDs directly. Because even a moderate brightness LED can, uh, can lead to a fairly painful sensation. Uh, the background luminance really uh, has an impact, and this is a great example of it, right? So direct glare is a big problem on the road, and it's driven by the fact that when the direct glare is the most problematic, uh, you are at night and therefore your background luminance is very close to zero. And that makes any light source much more likely to cause uh, direct glare issues, especially if you don't carefully control that light source and prevent it from rising above the uh, hood of another car and in directly into their cabin. And finally, of course, is position in the field of view. Uh, so th it's relationship specifically to the task. Uh, so do you have to look towards that light source to do what you need to do? And so this is a great example, the stop sign here. If you're trying to look at that stop sign and the sun is directly behind it, it's going to be problematic. For lighting design, we need to keep in mind the geometry uh, of the, the task, the visual task in our space in relation to the light sources. 
And we don't want to place light sources directly behind a place that you expect your occupants to spend time looking at. All right. So that does bring me to the end of this lecture. I appreciate uh, your time and hopefully I gave you some solid actionable design guidance on how to improve visual performance and visual comfort.